one. Hello, everyone, and welcome to VAC Roundtable number 64. And we have a special one. It, of course, is uh, Veterans Day. So thank you all for uh, your services. And anybody who's watching uh, who is uh, a service member or has served, also thank you for your service. I uh, want to also state that you are watching a CBG content providing broadcast. And since it's the end of the week, but not the end of the world, it must be time for the VAC roundtable. Oh, of course, technical difficulty. Minor. There we go. All right. So basically, uh, we're taking a special guest with us tonight, which is Council Member Al Byrne. He is a regular with us, but uh, he also published his uh, his own book. Uh, <clears throat> and we're going to be discussing that as well as uh, just kind of peppering him with questions because Al has had a, uh, a long life and is... Uh, you know, eight decades on this planet. So he has a, a lot of wisdom and we can't thank you enough for taking the time to uh, join us, Al. Uh, please tell everybody about your book and then I will go into the first question. So welcome council member, Al Byrne. Well, thanks guys. And uh, yeah, folks, uh, this gang and I meet frequently, a couple of times a week. So uh, we're uh, we're very close. We know a lot of people about each other, and I very much appreciate their uh, their offering for me to have you know my moment in the sun here about the book I uh, I wrote and has been recently published. The name of it is Four F O R Four Country and Cannabis, and I think that it, it, if you think about it, yeah. Thank you, Peggy. Uh, uh, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a memoir, but as the publisher has said, it's sort of a different memoir. It's a one of a kind because it's it's not really about my life. I don't go into a lot of detail. I go into some, but not a lot about what ha happened to me. Uh, but I do, I do go into a lot of detail about what happened to me within the cannabis world. Uh, and that's what the book's about. It, it's about my experience over... Well, it started in 1967 is when the book begins, and it ended last year, 2022, the book anyway, not the world. And, uh, and, and what happened to me with cannabis in between the people? I, I especially uh, wanted people who were great people, noble people, uh, dedicated people to be remembered. And... A number of people over the t course of time said, Al, if you don't write this down, who the hell is going to write it down? You're the guy that was there. And as I put on my book cover, uh, a, a huge number, percentage of the people that I write about in this book are dead. Uh, the, you know, and, and I, I wanted their accomplishments to be uh, historically remembered. Because I think at some point in time, American historians are going to look at this drug war like they've looked at all the other stupid goddamn shit we got involved in, and they're going to know, well, uh, how did it happen? How do we avoid it, et cetera, and who did what that was good? And I, I wanted the good part to be remembered as long as, the, the, you know, because the, there'd be enough bad stuff. But I also, in the book, put down a lot of names and numbers of people that I think are just friggin' assholes uh, and that were uh, negative uh, to the whole uh enterprise of getting medicine for sick people. They got in the way. And not just the federal government. I mean, people that work for, you know, ostensibly for legalization or whatever. Uh, they were negatives. And and uh, I identify them and I say why. It, in my opinion, they were negatives. Um, but it's a history book. It's a history of what happened that made medical cannabis available in the United States today. Yeah, I know it's not universal, et cetera. It's not done yet. We get to that. There's a question about that. But uh, but look where we've come from my perspective. When I started this in 1967, it, was, it wasn't a dead issue. It was no issue at all. 
And and when I began my little process of, of opening up this world in the 80s, I'd say uh, 95% of the American public thought I was crazy, and 5% thought I had something to go. Well, now it's flipped. Now it's 5% think I'm nuts, and then 95% are, are patting me on the back, just like you guys. Thank you. Uh, so that's why I wrote the book, because I thought uh, that these people that were advising me were correct, that if I didn't, nobody would. Uh, so I did it for country and cannabis. It's 360 pages. I, I believe it's uh, I, I, everybody that has read it has said, man, that's that's a good read for various reasons. They like it. But uh, I want to I want to give you the first words of the book that I wrote in the book. And they're, they're not mine. Uh, th this is a quote by uh, a long dead uh, Roman emperor named Marcus Aurelius. And, and so if you want to know exactly why I wrote this book, I'd have to say I wrote it to educate. And here's what Marcus said about that. He said, the opinion, opinion of 10,000 men is of no value if none of them know anything about the subject. That's why I wrote the book. Because what I've been dealing with since 1967 is ignorance. You know, people say, uh, oh, it's the pharmaceutical industry that's screwing us up. There's, no, it isn't. It's part of it, maybe. Sure, I don't know. But what's, what, I've, what I've tried to fight, and I, I think reasonably successfully now, is ignorance. And that's what VAC is doing as a group. You guys, we know what we're doing. We're fighting ignorance. That's what we're really doing. We do it in different ways, and we have different phrases. Where we're fighting stupidity, and and people that, like Marcus, they have opinions of no value. Thank you for that, Al. And for the, those who are watching at home, this is the cover of the book for Country and Cannabis, and the graphic of, of course, that's Al, his dogs in his pickup truck, looking out over the river there. So. It's available uh, in paperback as well as uh, on Kindle. Um, so you can get it digitally as well. So um, thank you, Al, for joining us. And of course, we start off with, you know, uh, the universal question, which is, how did you come to cannabis? You know, how did you get turned on and what made it your pathway? Yeah, you know, we ask everybody this question and it's it's been interesting to me. I didn't come that way. Uh, I, I was, I knew cannabis existed. We call it grass, I think, in, in Boston then. Maybe we called it uh, pot, but I think grass was the common expression. And I knew it was around, uh, but I didn't use it. My immediate friends didn't use it. It just wasn't part of my social being. Uh, I went to the University of Notre Dame Cannabis, medicine, uh, marijuana was not uh, part of that structure or social structure either. Although I did leave, live off campus for my junior and senior year, and my roommate from Florida uh, would bring uh, pot up from uh, Florida and smoke it in, in his room. And, uh, you know, it all seemed okay. But it, it didn't have anything to do with me. Uh, I got I got out of Notre Dame. I got commissioned almost the same day. I went on a destroyer, and before the year was up, my father was diagnosed with cancer. It was going to kill him. There was uh, uh, kidney cancer. Uh, I'm sorry, liver cancer. It was going to kill him. Uh, so to to just shorten up the story, it's a story. Uh, but I got my father some cannabis on some good advice. I gave it to him, and uh, it helped him die. Is the best way I can say it. It, it gave him some comfort. It allowed him to have an appetite and to eat without throwing up his food. Uh, gave him a little nutrition, gave him a little more time. Uh, it didn't cure him, but it, it should it help him. And, and that's how I came to cannabis. I, I came to it in 1967 as a, uh, a medicine, really, for my, for my dad. Uh, and... You know, I saw it work, is, is what I could say. Well, I'm one of these guys that I'm, I'm big on observation. 
And if I see something that seems to be working, I, I friggin' pay attention and I remember it. And so I'm still remembering uh, all these years later. And, and that's how I came to cannabis. Now, fast forward, uh, uh, and now I, I served uh, in the Navy about eight years. I was just back from Vietnam. I spent a year in Vietnam. I was stationed in Hawaii, and I was a wreck, just like the rest of us when we came back from that friggin' place. Uh, but I, I had a wife, I two great kids. Uh, the Navy was treating me well, but I was not doing well, you know, in my head. And I was there with a couple of guys that I'd served with in Vietnam, and they weren't doing well either. Uh, and then my sister showed up from Massachusetts. We want, you know, <laughs> we invited her, okay? Uh, we wanted her there. Anyway, uh, of all things, she, uh, she brought pot from Massachusetts for me to use because uh, she just knew from talking to me on the phone and stuff that I was screwed up. And she was she had used cannabis successfully for a number of years. And so my sister gave me cannabis. And uh, within a couple of tries, not the first couple, but certainly within the first couple of tries, three maybe, I knew that I had found something that was going to help me uh, relax, uh, relax, just sort of get back into the world that I was in, not the world that I'd left. And... Uh, and I was 27 years old. Uh, so that was, I was that old before I ever used cannabis. But that's how I came to it. Thank you for that. Uh, next up will be Council Member Nate Landau. Council Member Landau. There we go. Sorry, turn the camera around. First of all, Al, I want to thank you so much for your endless decades of service in the military and then your endless uh, decades of service in the cannabis industry. We're, you're, you're the giant that we're the shoulders we stand on. So I want to thank you for that. And the question is, what would your life have been like if cannabis had never been vilified and was still on a pharmacy shelf when you were a young man and your family needed it? Thanks, Nate. Uh, you know, I'm, I've never been a pretty good soothsayer. <laughs> you know, what would it have been? I don't know. Uh, you guys, I, I thought of that question, and I thought, well, there's two guys that had a comment about that kind of thing. One was Robert Frost, the noted American poet. Yeah. And Frost said something. I might not get this exactly right, but he, he said, when you, when you come to a fork in the road, it might be best to take the one less traveled. Uh, and then one of my absolute athletic heroes of all time, Yogi Berra, he said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> well, I guess that's what it would have been. Uh, that's the only thing I can tell you. I, I'm happy I went to Notre Dame. Very, very happy. I'm happy I served in the Navy. Very, very happy about that. I'm happy uh, children, uh, all of that, good friends. You know, I, I think all of that would have worked, except maybe I could have done something useful instead of fighting ignorance. Good points. <clears throat> uh, next up will be uh, Council Member Peggy Jones. Council Member Jones. Good evening, Al. Thank you for joining us, and thank you for your service. During your years you worked in Hawaii, you were around influential people who could make real change and you overheard these conversations is there anything you felt you could have accomplished then knowing what you now know yeah well boy that got me thinking uh the hawaii i existed in was from 1971 to 1975 so it was essentially the last years of the vietnam war and i had just come to hawaii from vietnam in the summer of 71. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, I was still there. Like, like I said, I just said a minute ago, when I, when I got to Hawaii, I, I, I wasn't in Hawaii. It was back someplace. Uh, 
So uh, I, I took some notes here. The, the situation in, in Vietnam was was really sketchy. I, I went there as a, an advisor. So when I was going in alone, hundreds, thousands of guys were going out the same day. The regular army, the regular navy, the regular, they're leaving. Thousands of them. And then they left us behind to uh, train what was left of the Vietnamese Navy and the uh, Army of the Republic of Vietnam. And they did a good job. The guys did a good job. But uh, but you can tell, I mean, it, it, when you lived, I lived with the Vietnamese. The, the regular troops, they can't stand to be around a Vietnamese. I lived with them. They were, they were the guy. They were the reason I was there, right, to help them. Uh, it was a civil war. This wasn't a war about the United States and Russia. In, in, in Vietnam, it was a civil war. It was as much a civil war as we had in the North-South conflict in, in the 60s, 1860s. And, and you could just tell it wasn't going to come out right. Uh, it was too much. There's too much religion involved, the Catholics and the Buddhists. And uh, the North, it's just, it was a mess. So I, I said, I, my, my thoughts after being there for a year was, my thought after being there for a week was, I got to get every one of my guys out of this place alive. It wasn't worth dying for. After being there for a year, I thought, yeah, uh, it's out of control. And so to answer your question, no, I, the people that I, I sort of quote in my book were State Department personnel. These weren't soldiers, military. These were State Department. This was Lodge's people and Kissinger's people. And they were looking in 73 for a way out. They were, we had turned over the war to the, to the South Vietnam Army and Navy, and they were doing okay, except we betrayed them because we told them when we left we would provide them with air power, which we didn't, and that was the difference. Uh, and so the State Department folks that I had these, uh, I heard these conversations having, uh, were looking, they were looking for a scapegoat. Uh, I, I just saw them dickering around in their administrative language. Uh, they were looking for a way out. It wasn't us. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, Ambassador Kissinger. No, no, he's a good guy. It wasn't Lodge. They were perfect. So who the hell are we going to pick on? Well, I know. Let's pick on the E3 Marine. You know, uh, low-hanging fruit, easy target, unable to defend themselves. And as all of you know, if you've looked at how we came home from Vietnam, these E3 Marines were already shitheads. They were baby killers. They were, you know, the scum of the earth. And so it was easy to just give them another uh, really uh, awful, uh, uh, honorific title. They lost the war. No, they didn't. But that's, so anyway, could I do nothing? I, I, I say in my book, there was a day, and I am serious. I thought there, and I said, you know, I could poison these bastards. I'm feeding them. I can put some in there and kill them all. I didn't, but I damn well thought about it. Uh, so now, you know, it was out of control. And if, if you read through the book, you'll see that, uh, one of the major problems in the command of the Pacific, which it originated in Pearl Harbor, not in, in the Pentagon, uh, was alcohol. They were drunk, these admirals and generals. Drunk. Read my book. Uh, and so the decisions being made, therefore, were of dubious judgment. It was out of control. Thank you for that honest uh, and very real uh, breakdown. Uh, next up will be Council Member Tony Landry. Council Member Landry, you're recognized. Well, thank you, Dan and Al. It's always an honor to be to hear you and uh, your stories and uh May, I've been out to your, your uh, Patients Out of Time conference. I was really inspired by the way you was, uh, uh, you know, you had a long history of treating doctors and that. But what inspired you, um, you mentioned that 
what inspired you to use cannabis uh, as a medicine, but what inspired you to be a proponent, like an advocate of um, of cannabis? My favorite hat, Tony. Nice. Oh, thank you, Al. You're very welcome. Uh, my dad's death and my ex-wife, Marilyn Matthew. Uh, they were the combination of uh, things just, uh, you know, I, uh, I had this, this, this thing with my dad. I knew I had to do something with cannabis, and I didn't know what the hell it was. And then when uh, I married Mary Lynn, we were, I was stationed in uh, the Naval Air Station in Whidbey Island, Washington. And Mary Lynn worked as a charge nurse at a hospital uh, right up the road at a, in a quarters. And uh, they got a patient. Now, this is back in 82, maybe. Uh, they got a patient in this hospital from the University of Washington, a pain patient. And they were giving this man uh, experimental cannabis for pain control. And Mary Lynn got assigned to be the, uh, the nurse that, you know, pro provided the medicine over a two or three week period or something like that. And the guy did great. And she saw this. So then skip forward a couple of years, uh, master's degree time in Cleveland on my last duty station. And she was getting her master's degree. And she came to me one night and said, you know, I got to write a thesis here to get my math done. What do you think I should do? I have two choices that I'm thinking of, pain control or cannabis. And I said, Marilyn, you know, I, I'm not knocking pain control, but a lot of people do pain control. Nobody's written anything up about cannabis. And, uh, and she agreed and did a study. And the study was basically to uh, identify whether patients uh, would would tell their doctor, their nurse, their primary, whatever, uh, their, about their use of cannabis. Uh, you know, a legitimate thing for master's degree. And uh, we use normal. We'll get to normal in a minute. But we use normal as a conveyor of the, the, uh, the forms that were sent out, uh, the survey forms, if you will. Uh, there were 5,000 of them. We used uh, all of all of normal's uh, mail list. It's now five thousand, and astoundingly, usually in those days, you got back three percent, five percent, maybe eight percent of the forms came back. We got something like eighty-eight percent. It was astounding. Uh, and and the answer to the questions were, yeah, yeah, these people would, as cannabis patients, tell their doctor and their nurse that they were using cannabis for their particular problem. But then we had sort of a general question put on at the end, Marilyn wrote it in. It was like, uh, well, what the hell do you use it for anyway? Oh, it's so basic, it was crazy. But then we started reading the answers. Now this is 19, let us say, middle of the 80s. Now we knew back then that cannabis was just like for my dad, a great anti-emetic, keep people from throwing up, basically. That's what helped my dad so much. And, and we knew it was a great, uh, 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 it, it reduced the interocular pressures of the eye. We knew that. Glaucoma. So that was good. We knew that. That's all we knew. Well, we're, we're sitting down there, and, and I'm reading these 5,000 reports, and it says, uh, I use it for sickle cell. I use it for morning sickness. I use it for multiple sclerosis. I use it for Crohn's disease. I use it for pain. Uh, it, on and on. And I sat there as a well-educated young man that had been around a bit and went, holy shit, I had no idea. And it wasn't, uh, and these people, there wasn't one or two of these. It was thousands of answers like this. Thousands of them. Uh, so that, that was it for me. Uh, that night, I committed to myself that I knew something that everybody needed to know. And, and off we went. And, you, and, it, and off just, you went. <laughs> you did. Thank you, right. Al. Thank you. Thank you for that. Next up will be Council Member Brian Buckley. And uh, happy birthday to the Marines there. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Al, congratulations on a great book. I uh, really enjoyed reading it. I've been telling some people around uh, my neck of the woods about it, and they're looking forward to getting their hands on. So really, what a great accomplishment. And like you said, I, you know, you really helped all of us by getting that down on paper uh, and sharing that. And that way, it's going to be around forever. So excellent work. Um, my question is, what did it take for you to get medical cannabis to be accepted by normal? I didn't. They didn't. Uh, the, the issue of introducing medical cannabis and hemp into the normal hierarchy was uh, uh, just not something that those people wanted to accept. Now, let me explain something about that. What, what we're talking about here is, is uh, the late 1980s, and normal uh, was founded to legalize cannabis. And it was founded by a, a guy named Keith Strop, a lo young lawyer. He did a great job. And uh, he attracted a lot of other lawyers, and they went out and they started doing all kinds of law things, and and it was all uh, it was all exciting, uh, and they did they did pretty goddamn good good work. I mean, they, they did, but everything was about the law, the law, the law. Uh, they changed the law; everything will be fine. Well, you know, normal still out there, and they're still trying to change the law. Uh, and, and remember, 1985. So. I got there uh, by invitation and by skill, daring, and pure dumb luck, and because they couldn't get anybody else to work for nothing, I ended up on the board and the executive director of the place for a couple of years. And we straightened it out financially and uh, and fought fought off the lawyers. Normal at the time was, was really... I think ETN can explain this too, if, <laughs> just as well as I could. But it was nothing more than a, a, a referral uh, office for lawyers. If you got busted in Idaho, you called Normal, and you said, I got busted in Idaho, and they gave you the name of a normal lawyer that to uh, represent you. Uh, you know, it was, that's all it was. And, and so the lawyers, were, were they loved it. And then in comes Al and says, hey, wait a minute, you know, I'm the executive director here, and I think we need to do a few other things. I had hooked up with Jack Herr on the hemp issue. Uh, Mary Lynn and I were discussing the, right then, we went in there with this in our heads about the medical marijuana issue. They called it then, now it's medical cannabis. And, uh, and so that was, that was my agenda, to, uh, to get those two things underway. Uh, and we gave Jack all the support we could, and he did a great job with hemp, as we all know. And uh, then in uh, the, the break in, in normal, uh, the lawyers just couldn't stop it, was that we got a conference together in 1990 in D.C. that involved the first five legal federal patients. And it was a great show. Uh, and uh, C-SPAN covered it. All eight hours, two days of it, showed it over and over and over again for a month or two on their channel. It, it, it view, every eight hours, there was something about normal in medical marijuana. And I've told people in the past that normally at normal in those days, we get about 400 calls a week. And mainly they were looking for a lawyer to defend their bust. That week, we got 40,000. We couldn't handle it. Uh, 40,000. And it was people from uh, everywhere and every class. There were, you know, Hollywood celebrities wanted to do something and da 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 da. Um, that day, that weekend in Washington, D.C., that sort of uh, uh, representation we got from C SPAN over the next month, that, that was it. If I had to pick a day that it all began, that was, that was the weekend. Uh, and normal didn't have anything to do with it. Normal fought me, fought Maryland, fought those that supported us on the medical issue and just got outvoted. And and after we left, meaning the medical cannabis people and the and the hemp people all left normal, they went right back to doing what they wanted to do was talk legalization and refer themselves to their lawyer buddies. And that's what they still do. So uh the answer to your question is normal is 
is not involved. Never was. And, and even when they decided to get involved, I was at the first National Medical Marijuana Day in D.C. in 94. Um, they asked us not to smoke our medical marijuana yeah, because we were in Lafayette Park. And we were like, yeah, sorry, we didn't travel all the way out here to be medical protesters and not smoke our cannabis. So, yeah, Normal has had a, uh, an interesting um, transition around cannabis and medical cannabis and Thank you for that perspective. And for those who don't know, Al Byrne was a director with the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws uh, back in the 70s. So he's very educated about uh, and speaks from a, uh, a place of knowledge as somebody who was literally there in the room. Uh, next up would be Council Member uh, Wade Laughter. Council Member Laughter. Yeah, thank you, Jen. Um, <clears throat> Al. Um... So much respect and uh, gratitude for having the chance to know you and uh, very much enjoyed reading your book. Um, one of the things, I was in the Navy myself and um, it was certainly known in the 70s that people in the military were smoking. Was there ever a point in your service when at some duty station you might've been at where senior enlisted and or the officers kind of recognized that cannabis was happening amongst the lower ranks and chose to look the other way as versus trying to stamp it out? Yes. Uh, there are actually several instances. Yeah, there, there are several instances. And as an ex-Navy guy, you'll, you'll understand some of the situations. But certainly my year in Vietnam, in combat, if you will, that, that the whole damn place was a mess. Uh, the sailors there that I met and were responsible for, I mentioned this in my book, were of two categories. Uh, we called those that drank alcohol juicers and those that used cannabis heads. So they were the heads and the juices. And, and this, uh, this distinction is so well made in the movie Platoon. Uh, uh, there's a whole scene of, of the difference of the, 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 the society of the heads and the juices, if you will, even in a war zone, how different it was. Uh, yeah. So, yes, in Vietnam, it was, I think, assumed and allowed. Uh, Everybody in that mess had a chance, if they had a chance to relax, to, to drink a little too much or smoke, uh, you know, they, they yes, it's a reward. They, they want a hell of a lot of rewards. So uh, that was certainly one. And the officers that I knew that I worked with, none of them had a problem with their troops smoking uh, cannabis. None of them. Now, we also knew our troops, we work with these guys, we live with these guys, we travel with these guys. Uh, they weren't our troops, they were our friends. And uh, none of that shit happened on duty. Nobody drank anything or smoked anything when there was a chance of any kind of problem. I'm talking about when we were somewhere of relative safety, not safety, no such thing, relative safety. Well, then you, you had a chance. So, yeah, Vietnam was certainly a place. Uh, uh, when when uh, Reagan became president in uh, uh, 1980, I was on active duty, and uh, Reagan uh, declared that all members of the armed forces would uh, be subject to your analysis, everybody, uh, officers, enlisted, anybody. And uh, that was... That was uh, as a result of a poll taken in the Marine Corps, Brian, in that year or the year before that showed that 50% uh, of the active duty Marines had used cannabis in the prior 30 days. Uh, and boy, did that trigger something right there. Uh, uh, anyway, that was, if, if, if not a trigger, it was certainly used as an excuse to begin the urine program we have still going on, which is pretty useless, but it's been pretty devastating and awful. So yeah, uh, Wade, uh, th th that for sure. Uh, and uh, again, I, I, 
I never, I never ran into an officer in the Navy that was super critical in that regard about cannabis. They go nuts about cocaine or meth or something, and rightfully so. Uh, but now they saw their, some of their troops sneaking off to smoke a joint after work. They just figured these guys are going to come back to work tomorrow. They're going to feel good. They're not going to be hungover. And they were right. So, yes, I, I, we called a program when I was in it. I smoked cannabis uh, while I was on active duty, not while I was working, but, you know, on weekends and stuff. And uh, uh, we called it Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Uh, and I think that was repeated later uh, by the homosexual community. But it came, came about from the military. Don't ask, don't tell. About what year was that when you f had that first discussion where uh, they were like, okay, yeah. this is how it's going to be? I'm sorry, ETM, my dogs went off. First discussion of what? Uh, when this actually happened, when you were discussing, uh, when you had those discussions that uh, Wade was talking about, was that like 66, 67, 68? Oh, oh, oh I see. Well, the, the Vietnam era was, for me, it was 1970 and 71. Okay. So we're into that. Uh, the Reagan doctrine was 10 years later, uh, 1980. Uh, so certainly in that 10-year period, uh, those kinds of discussions were, were had among uh, privately were held. Thank you for that clarification. All right. Uh, next up will be Council Member Michael Krawitz. Council Member Krawitz. Thanks, ATN. Oh man, now I, I don't even know where to start to thank you for uh for your um your kind of thought leadership and uh and 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 effort. Uh you know, like uh Nate was saying, really timeless effort that you put in um to the to the cannabis space to to help us as fellow vets and help fellow patients, uh and, and just really on the side of uh of, the, of our constitution and and on the side of the evidence uh which is, is is a cool fight in and of itself i i feel like saying something just you know for in general for people who may be tuning in that aren't veterans at least from my perspective it seems like we're all at least three different people so like we're the person that we got that got recruited right recruiters are well known to sort of grab on people's patriotism a lot a lot of people you know there's a certain portion of, of our joining the military that was out of patriotism they're, they're very known for selling the educational benefits uh and uh travel and and other things you know these are the things that appeal to the to the citizen in us that signs on the dotted line and says what the heck we'll go ahead and join the military and serve our country and then and then you're the troop the troop is <laughs> the troop is a different person entirely the troop's been read in on stuff that you didn't want to know that you'll never be able to unlearn and uh, that's that's a whole another story and then you know when you're done with that then you become the veteran and for military veterans uh, rather much across the board i've seen uh just an incredible amount of uh of of energy and, and a, an incredible amount of focus on on uh sort of i don't, I don't know it, it's it's sort of like realizing well you're out of the service you don't have the power of the military anymore but you you still can get stuff done you can still get a job done you can still get a mission accomplished and it's a different mission now it's a mission for everybody um veterans are able to lead and and i've never met a veteran yet that didn't very quickly say that what they're doing is for everybody, not just for military vets. So anyway, that's that's my message to non-vets today. And and for you, Al, I just, I just want to say thank you. Like the book doesn't do you justice as far as like it tells your story, it tells your perspective. But what I'd love for people to understand is above your perspective, if I had to name like 20 minds, 20 thought leaders that actually got in this chess game against the United States federal government, in fact, against all the governments of the world back in the 1970s, and said, no, we're going to win this chess game. We're going to put cannabis across the board. We're going to create medical cannabis. We're going to create a new FDA if you won't work with us. We'll create a new you know, uh, DEA if, if you don't work with us, whatever we have to do. And we did it. And uh, Al stood toe to toe and, and was part of that group of minds 
you know, with people like Dennis Perone and Jack Herr and Dr. Todd McCurria and others uh, that actually helped us win this chess game. And, and now, you know, they're down to nothing but pawns. We still have the queen and both our castles on the board. So we don't even really look at the chess board all that much anymore. But the chess game's still going on and we haven't won yet. But uh, Al's leadership continues. And I just want to thank you for that. And, and on, on that note, this question, I'm going to rewrite it sl slightly. Uh, I, I, I'd like to know um, what, what instead of what do you think it will take uh, to get cannabis over the finish line to actual legalization. I, I'd rather ask you, what what do you call actual legalization? What for you will be cannabis legalization? And and then, you know, how how do you see us getting there? What do you think are going to be the, the bigger final hurdles to getting us to, to that vision? Yeah, well, thanks, Mike. Of course, but Mike and I have been partners in this for over 20 years. Uh, so, you know, he says, Al, you did this, you did this. Yeah. But Mike was right there. And so were a lot of other people that it was a team thing. It's always a team thing. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, the finish line, I don't know. Uh, the, the finish line uh, for me, uh, let me, let me give you the definition first. You asked that. That's fair. For me, I want to see, uh, you know, you're asking about legalization, and that's really not my thing. But I, I think it means the same thing as, to me as medical cannabis for everybody. It means that everybody gets medical cannabis, and that is in any form they wish to get it. Uh, if I'm a patient and I want some sort of pharmaceutical grade cannabis that comes out of an honest to God pharmacy and it's got labels and testing all over it, then I should be able to get it and they should be able to get it. If I want to grow my own medical cannabis in my backyard, I should be able to do that as well. Uh, and uh, so uh, to me, there is no uh, acceptable answer to your question, Mike, except that uh, it should be able to be used by anybody in this country that wants to use it. And, and I, will, I will include on this children. Now, I don't think children should use cannabis on their own, but I certainly, in my experience teaching all this stuff for years, there is a great, great need in some cases for young children to be able to use cannabis, and they should be able to, certainly medically and under medical supervision. So I don't I don't have any reservations on the cannabis. It hasn't killed anybody. It's never gone out. Uh, it's good for you. Uh, if you eat it, it's great for you. If you use it as a medicine, it can really help you. Uh, so that's it. To, to me, uh, that to me would be legalization. If you can use it as medicine, you can use it as medicine. Because as our past deceased pharma vet friends, you once said, Dennis, all cannabis use is medical and he's right dennis was right um if if you use cannabis even if you're just recreationally using it no that's medical guys that's you're sitting there somewhere with your friends or you're in a dark room or you're listening to music and you calm down and your anxiety level goes down and your blood pressure drops that's good and cannabis can do all that. So uh, uh, I think the answer, Michael, is what I just told you. Everything for everybody at every level of quality that can be possibly provided. We can do it. We, we should do it. We will do it. Now, the next part of your question, of course, is unanswerable. Uh, you know, what's the magic day? This is all going to happen. Well, I don't know. If I knew, man, I'd have bets out right now. <laughs> and I don't. Uh I think it's going to be the way it's been. Uh, over the years, the 40 decades, I can't tell you how many people have come and gone with the magic answer. Like, uh, do what I say, uh, do it this way, and uh, this will be over in three months. <laughs> well, they're all gone, see, and I'm still here. And uh, so, so I think it's going to be what it's been. It's going to be incremental. And so far, uh, the incrementals work pretty good. It's going to work even better. It's going to be even faster. Hell, we just had Ohio go legal, right? And grow your own. Uh, it's coming. 
and it's going to be that way. Uh, the federal government, they're morons. We, we all agree with that. Any, anybody in the federal government that looks out the window and sees what's going on in that country and doesn't say, let's, let's make this, uh, this prohibition go away. It's just a moron. Uh, and, but again, the beginning of my book, the opinion of 10,000 men that know nothing is of no value. So it's got to be incremental because we've got 10,000 men we've got to uh, educate. At least. <clears throat> well, thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. And most importantly, uh, thank you, Al, uh, for those again. Uh, it's for Country and Cannabis by Al Byrne. Look forward at uh, your local bookstore or especially, uh, you know, on Amazon. It's also available in Kindle. Uh, Council Member Buckley. Yeah, thank you. Um... You know, Al, could you maybe just tell us you know, how how did it feel writing the book and how did you feel after you accomplished it? Well, the after part was easy. Wow, that's done. <laughs> uh, uh, writing it, uh, it had, uh, I went two ways, Brian, depending on what, I, what my story was. You know, it's a book of stories, folks. That's what I do. I tell stories. So I tried to tell stories in the book that would have some meaning, that would uh, you know, show some purpose to to what the whole thing was about. So I wrote some stories that were very positive. Uh, really good shit happened to people and things. And, and, and so, Brian, those chapters, those stories, I felt great. But when I was writing the chapters about what the federal government did to Corinne Millette, make her go blind, for instance, just one, uh, there was, uh, I was sort of back in the wire wishing I could poison somebody. Uh, there's, you know, I'm a vet, right? I'm going to react to my situation. And those stories were stories, but they were situations to me. And, uh, and, and Corinne Millette to you guys is a name in a book to me. She was a friend. Uh, so a lot of that book is personal. Uh, and, uh, so I'm a person, I got emotions. Uh, I went everywhere. And you did, and we're thankful you that you did. Any other follow-up questions, people? I just want to point out to everybody that this is the Marine Corps birthday. We have Brian Buckley, a very, very decorated, honorable Marine here uh, on the show. And, of course, I just want to point out to everybody that doesn't really understand, the Marine Corps is part of the Navy. It, it's, it's part of the Navy. That, that's all I wanted to point out. <laughs> the infantry part of the Navy, right? <laughs> yes, it is, yeah. Other than the Seabees, yeah. <laughs> uh, now, uh, hey, all right, well, you worked with the CBs for seven years, and you said that they were some of the most um, awesome years that you had in the military. What about them and watching them work inspired you? Well, certainly the professionalism of that bunch of guys is uh, beyond question. But why did it was it so cool? Because we built things. We were building stuff. We were putting up buildings and piers and runways and and we were building things. And and the rest of my Navy career, I was in uh, on a destroyer in a gun mount destroying things. Uh, I watched Vietnam be blown to pieces. When I was with the Seabees, we weren't in a combat situation, but we built stuff. We took care of people. It was cool. It felt good. And and, uh, and and none of those troops had a problem with working extra hours to fix that school up or to finish that road. Nobody. Uh, exceptional group of young men. I just recall how, yeah, you, you hold them in such a light, and that had to be <clears throat> pretty amazing. Yeah, to, uh, And they live so, so shitty. Far. Nothing, I mean, something they, presentable. They live so shitty, though, E.T. And I just want to point out that a lot of civilians don't understand this. I'm not even sure the Army does. But uh, I went to this battalion, 
and uh, we, were, we were deployed to Puerto Rico, and there's about 880 men in this battalion. We had no women now. And uh, when we were done with that 10-month deployment, 36% of the married men in that battalion, battalion were divorced, including me. Uh, one week later, I went to Diego Garcia. I spent 11 months on this island. There were 1,400 men out there, and there was no women, not one. And when we came back from that island, 86% of the, the married men were divorced. They didn't do anything. I'll tell you, these guys didn't fool around. They weren't screwing around with octopuses or anything like that. Uh, and... and uh, so, you know, that's that's one of the rigors of the military that even the military, I don't think, understands. That's a tough life. You know, we were living in the middle of no place on the desert. We were living in cardboard shacks, all well, plywood shacks with a tin roof for 11 months at a time. We got mail in or out once a week if the plane made it from the Philippines and it took the plane eight hours just to get to us. We were out there. And uh, and that, that sort of, and, and, and yet the, those Seabees, those, those 1,400 men that I was with, again, all men, not one of them cracked. Not one of them said, this is too much for me. Not one of them says, I'm not going to work today. Not one. A amazing group of people. I could see why it would be an honor to work alongside such uh, people who could literally build anything. <laughs> all right. Well, everybody. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, Peggy Jones, Brian Buckley, Nate Landau, Tony Landry, Michael Krawitz, Wade Laughter, and Kelly joined us, who is Alburn's daughter. So thank you for joining us, Kelly. Uh, Kelly, do you have any questions for your dad? No, just thank you for your service, Commander. I love you. Oh, I can't say it better than that. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. And of course, uh, Al, um, can't thank you enough for joining us. Happy Veterans Day to you. Thank you for your decades of service as well as your service in the drug war. And uh, we hope that one ends soon. So that uh, council member laughter. Just want to add my voice to the chorus of gratitude and thanks for uh, the opportunity to get to know Al Byrne just a little bit better. Um, I know your story is only part of who you are, but uh, your heart keeps showing through. So thank you, Al. That's all I got. Well, again, can't say it much better. So you're loved and appreciated, Al. And again, people, for Country and Cannabis by Al Byrne uh, is the book. So check it out. Lots of great information and stories in the history of Cannabis, the cannabis movement in there, that's, uh, you know, crucial history, I think. Uh, but uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. This has been VAC Roundtable, number 64, Al Byrne. Woohoo!